on it, can't stop thinking about, talking about. Um, so what we thought we would do uh, today on Being Patient is give you access to experts on your questions around caregiving, um, around protecting yourself, um, um, in relation to COVID-19. So I'm really happy to have with us um, Dr. Dylan Wint. He comes to us from the Cleveland Clinic in Las Vegas. Dr. Wint, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me and for doing this important program. So let's just start with um, vulnerability. We know that people with dementia are more vulnerable um, to contracting a virus like COVID, but, but explain to us why. You know, we don't know exactly why. One of the obvious reasons is that uh, dementia, the biggest risk factor is age and the biggest risk factor for having serious complications from COVID and other illnesses is age. So those two things sort of combine in the individual with dementia to put them at higher risk. Uh, there are also abnormalities in the immune systems of individuals with dementia. That's been best studies in, studied in Alzheimer's disease, but we see that in other dementias as well. And then there may be some things about the behavioral characteristics of dementia that lead to increased risk for uh, either contracting or getting sick from an infectious illness. Um, so for example, we know that hygiene is one of the things that folks with dementia often struggle with. Uh, also, when they do get ill, they may have trouble expressing that they're feeling different than they usually do. Um, and all of these things can lead to getting sick faster. And also, if you do get sick, not getting treatment as early. So um, we already have questions coming in. I mean, this is a topic I think a lot of people have a lot of anxiety on uh, right you. now. Um, one of the questions, one of the viewers, are, what are some of the most important COVID symptoms to look out for if people with dementia? I mean, I think one of the most scary things about this virus is people can be asymptomatic, right? So right. what's the key to early detection in people with dementia who maybe can't express themselves um, or articulate what's wrong um, as well? Well, some of the things that we know from other conditions and uh, you know, I should preface everything I say here with the fact that we know very little about this this disease at this time, and we know even less about how it specifically affects people with Alzheimer's disease. But as with other novel situations, we try and learn from the past. So one thing is that with dementia, um, sometimes increased confusion or sudden decline in someone's cognitive condition can signal a disease somewhere else in the body. This is sort of classic with urinary tract infections or dehydration that folks will become um, acutely more confused or, or have more trouble with their memory or change in behavior. And then it's important to look for other features of illness in general, uh, decrease in appetite, uh, less thirst or more thirst, um, anything that looks like a fever. So that can be sweating, uh, breathing faster, uh, reduced energy, reduced interactivity. Those can all be symptoms of, of this or other conditions. And it is important to remember that because COVID-19 is a pandemic and all over the world right now, our folks with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias aren't protected from the things that have been affecting them all along. So be vigilant and look out for those too. Um, unusual smell or color of the urine, um, coughing up sputum, uh, things like that. Um, a, an excellent question has come in um, with someone asking, can I, um, why would a doctor want my 82 year old mom who has Alzheimer's to come into her office? And it's a good question. You know, like at this point, should people risk taking their loved ones to the doctor, uh, to a hospital? Um, we're seeing what, what's happening in, in some cities and across the US. So what's your best advice? Well, I would say first that there's not a blanket statement that can be made about this. Uh, we have converted our visits to virtual visits sort of as a baseline, but there is uh, flexibility for patients that we need to see in order to assess their condition and those in whom their condition might pose a larger risk to them currently than COVID does. So 
I would say the best way to find out why your doctor might want your mother to come in is to ask your doctor. And if the answer doesn't seem suitable to you, uh, ask whether you can put off that appointment for another couple of months. Has come in. So if your loved one is showing symptoms, and we talked a bit about that, um, is it is it safer maybe for the moment just to keep them isolated at home or should they go straight to the ER? I mean, we know what the ER can be like. It could be traumatic, um, in, you know, without COVID, but is it is it more dangerous to take them out, um, you know, perhaps exposing other, what's your best advice? So this might be an unsatisfactory answer because again, it, I can't give a blanket statement, but I think the first thing you wanna do is call the primary care doctor. If you don't have access to a primary care doctor, then call an urgent care or emergency services because like you mentioned before, um, this can range all the way from having no symptoms to having devastating symptoms. And the people who really know about the course of COVID are the people who right now are our first responders and our emergency room and urgent care providers and our primary primary care doctors. There may be things that can be done at home to reduce the intensity of the disease without bringing someone to the emergency room and thus exposing them to other issues that we know can arise, particularly for, for our loved ones with dementia. So I would say to start by calling a medical professional who's familiar with that particular individual. Um, the next step, if that doesn't work out, would be to call someone who's familiar with COVID. Again, that's our ER and urgent care doctors. And then, and then finally, I think if you cannot get answers, it's probably best to try and get an evaluation in an urgent care or emergency room because it's very difficult to pick up some of the things that might lead to real problems in the future. So someone may not look bad right now, but if, if for example, their oxygenation level is low, that might be a signal that they're going to get very sick from this condition um, that you wouldn't be able to tell simply by looking. Yeah, and one of the things that's scary about this virus too is it seems to be go from, you know, the person is okay coping to 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 worse, to, to mm -hmm. severe in in very with very little warning, you know. It, like the cases that I have read about too, it's, it's, or, and I now personally know people impacted, um, you know, um, they were okay, you know, just less than a week ago and then bam, the virus really attacked the respiratory system. Um, I was wondering, I want to talk a little bit about co the compromising of the immune system in um, people with dementia. Do we know exactly why? I mean, age obviously is, an, is a factor, but not all people um, with dementia have, um, uh, are elderly. We have, uh, you know, an early onset population out there who are in their 40s, 50s in some cases. Do we know, um, is there a relationship between dementia and, and what it does to your immune system or, or is that specifically just because um, people with dementia tend to be older, therefore the risk is higher? So it is clearly not just age. For example, if you look at um, people hospitalized with pneumonia, an individual with Alzheimer disease or other dementia who's the same age as another person without cognitive dysfunction, uh, the person with Alzheimer's disease has a much higher risk of dying. I think the number is somewhere around seven times the risk of dying you know, over those next 30 days. So uh, dementia itself poses specific challenges when someone gets sick. Now, this may not be just immune because we see similar features, for example, with hip fractures. Um, people who are admitted for hip fractures, if they have dementia, have a much higher risk of, of dying over the next 30 to 90 days. Um, there are various abnormalities that have been found in the immune system in Alzheimer's disease, um, both in the, the central nervous system immune system, which is distinct from the rest of the bodies and the bodies as well. But the findings are generally kind of too diffuse and nonspecific to be able to make a, a clear blanket statement. Um, another question that's just come in um, asking, can people with dementia who are older survive COVID-19 and recover? Um, what's the best way to ensure them surviving, um, early identifying and being placed on oxygen? Almost certainly uh, folks will be able to recover. I can't say that I've heard of a specific case 
uh, nor have I heard of a specific case where someone had dementia and died. But I'm, I'm sure that um, there will be lots of people with dementia who recover from this. So the, the, the ways to reduce the risk are pretty much the same as for anything else. Yes, early detection and early treatment, um, making sure to manage the kinds of things that actually kill people in this disease. So uh, overwhelming lack of oxygenation, uh, respiratory failure. So if people can reduce that work of breathing, reduce the fever and so forth early, then that will increase their chances of survival. But I think even, even those features, things that we think are just common sense, are still unclear because uh, we don't, we just don't have enough information about the about the COVID nineteen illness. Uh, and you know, I was I was reading um, a uh, interview with an Italian journalist from Italy, and one of the things that she pointed out, which I thought was a really valid point, is that because this was labeled as an old person's disease, it actually made things much worse in Italy because That's the younger right. people felt like they were invincible, they wouldn't die, it was not that big a deal. But you know, now we're seeing that's so not true. It, this can, everybody is vulnerable. Um, and the fact that it was labeled as this old person's um, virus, you know, one that was more severe in old person, it, it actually hurt Italy significantly um, in Absolutely. terms of taking the pandemic seriously. Um, another question has come in asking, you know, we're hearing some reports that up to 70% of the population will contract the virus. Um, is this something you believe we should expect? I mean, it's the new norm. Is everyone, you know, most people are, are they going to have this virus? Well, yeah, I've heard similar numbers too. And I think some of those projections were made before we really put the kinds of restrictions that we have on social gatherings. So we may be able to reduce that significantly. However, it seems like the experts are saying at this point that this virus will become um, endemic, meaning that it's something that's found in typical healthy members of the population. They will have had it at some point in their lives. So, uh, you know, I don't know whether the number will end up being 70%, but uh, all indications are that this will be something that eventually most of us or a good proportion of us uh, will have had. We may not have had the illness, but a lot of us will have the virus in our systems. Yeah. It's that asymptomatic, right? That is the really... Sure. Yeah, that, that really um, causes the rapid spread as well. If you don't know you're sick and you're carrying it, um, the potential to spread it to, to people. Um, I'm curious from a medical standpoint, um, if you were to receive someone uh, in at Cleveland Clinic who um, was diagnosed with dementia and showing signs, is there any specifically, would you do anything differently than someone without dementia in terms of questions you'd ask or um, extra precautions? Well, I think as with um, other aspects of dementia and other comorbidities of dementia, that it's very important that the caregiver is also uh, involved in whatever treatment plan or whatever diagnostic methods are discussed because uh, uh, the caregiver is living with this also. Anything that affects someone with Alzheimer's disease or dementia ends up uh, affecting their caregiver. So I think that is one key thing, that the caregiver needs to be on board and well-informed. Um, I think also some of the advice that we give about medical conditions in folks with dementia, making sure to keep someone uh, oriented frequently, um, making sure to let them know that you are there because they will feel somewhat uncomfortable. They'll feel different from how they usually feel. And they may not remember why that is, you know, you or I get a, a cold and we wake up and our nose is stuffed and we say, oh, that's right, I have a cold. The person with dementia may wake up with a stuffy nose and it's a brand new information to them. Um, and keeping in close contact with uh, the whoever's taking care of the dementia, neurologist, psychiatrist, or primary care doctor, as well as uh, whoever's taking care of primary medical problems. And then uh, also look out for new symptoms that might develop, new dementia symptoms. Again, uh, cognitive decline is really common when people with dementia get sick with other things. So you have to think about um, the, all those things that you thought might happen a year from now, 
in the course of this illness they may happen now. So that means you need to keep a closer eye on what they're doing with their medications. You may need to help them out with their hygiene. They may temporarily become incontinent or have trouble with walking and balance that they didn't have before. So there needs to be additional vigilance to those neurologic symptoms as well in dementia folks and not necessarily in people who, who don't have dementia. So things like UTIs, um, you know, hidden hidden things, they you become increased risk because your immunity is down, and especially if you're you're attacking uh, a virus is attacking. It, it, is that what you mean? Well, uh, no, not exactly what I mean. That's true, but what I mean is that um, because getting ill with anything uh, compromises brain function. You get sick. I get sick with the flu or something like that. Uh, we might find we're a little bit more confused, slower to think, it's tougher to remember, tougher to stay alert. Well, when you put that on top of a compromised brain, then it really magnifies the situation. And so you may see neurologic symptoms that you haven't seen before in this individual come out simply because their brain is under stress from the virus. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, I mean, all we can do these days is read the papers and, you know, watch um, the news and we become more terrified um, with each passing day because we read about how unprepared a lot of hospital systems are around the world for this. Um, tell us a little bit about how Cleveland Clinic is preparing for COVID-19. Well, um, one of the things that we did very early on was start to gather equipment and increase our ability to test people for COVID-19. Um, we also have redeployed a lot of our workforce um, all the way from uh, the, the physicians and surgeons to uh, people who do the maintenance to make sure that we can handle what's going on. Um, we also for ourselves, we're checking people's temperature when they arrive, uh, that's employees' temperatures when they arrive so we can get early warning if anyone might be getting sick and reduce the risk if they'll spread it to other folks. And we also uh, got our hands on a lot of test kits to be able to test the folks that we that take care of to uh, first of all tell them whether they have uh, COVID so that we can reduce the spread so can anyone, um, I mean, how do you have uh, restrictions on who you will test? I mean, because that's what we're hearing around um, the U.S. for that matter. There's, and, um, you know, I just came from California and it's it's really difficult to get tested. Um, you know, one example, my sister had a bit of a cough and didn't want to go near my parents who are elderly um, and has tried on numerous occasions to get tested just to make sure she doesn't have it, mm -hmm. uh, but has failed. Um, so are there any restrictions um, that Cleveland is imposing on, uh, which it seems like most people in the US are in terms of who can get tested and who can't? Yeah, we are following the CDC guidelines in regard to testing because test kits overall, even though um, we are getting them uh, gathered, test kits overall are still in relatively short supply when you compare to the population. So we prioritize individuals who are at higher risk, so those are older folks. Uh, we prioritize, of course, people who have symptoms or who have clear exposures to someone who is positive. Um, so even though there are restrictions, we're still able to at least test that segment of the population, which we actually weren't able to do when this crisis first started. So um, Cleveland Clinic, and I'm sorry, I don't know the URL, but Cleveland Clinic does have an online screening tool to tell you whether it's likely that you have, uh, that you've been infected with the novel coronavirus. And at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, um, they do have testing, but you can't just walk up and get tested. You yeah. have to be evaluated by a physician who will then refer you for testing um, and you wait to get called to come in for your testing appointment. Because even though people need to be tested, we also still need to keep them away from each other. The yeah. last thing you want is for people to be in a long line waiting to be tested. Uh, you know, two of the five people are infected and they pass it along to the other three people in the line who, if they go and get tested at that moment, will test negative. Yeah. Then they will go and spread the virus. So and we have to control the, the means of testing also. I know that's very, very frustrating and disappointing to hear for a lot of people, but it's another way in which we, we have to operate to keep the virus from spreading. 
completely understandable given the circumstances. Um, we have a, a question that's actually a really good follow up to that, um, which is should hospitals allow caregivers to come in and visit their loved ones with dementia who are hospitalized with COVID? I mean, that's, um, that's a really yeah. big dilemma. I do not want to speak uh, specifically for a hospital or specifically for a given circumstance. However, I would be inclined to think that hospitals would restrict that kind of visitation and that they would want you to lean more towards visiting by phone or by video connection um, as opposed to being in bodily contact or being in the same room with someone who has COVID-19. You know, it's funny, I, as I hear this coming out of my mouth, it sounds so strange to me because I routinely tell people <clears throat> when their loved one with dementia is hospitalized that they need to be at the hospital as much as they can because their loved one often cannot speak for themselves. But in this case, um, it is more important to stay away and not spread the virus because remember, for most caregivers, if they get sick, if they go down, the person with dementia does not have much in the way of other resources. So they have to stay well themselves. That is an astounding problem to think about. I mean, we there's so many home caregivers um, across the U.S. Um, who dementia people with dementia are relying on. Um, so to take that out of um, commission. I, I can't even imagine what would happen. I mean, if you're a caregiver and you have COVID, you become ill, you need to go to the hospital. What happens to your loved one? I mean, that's something I don't think we've even comprehended. No. And uh, one of the things we're trying to stress is the importance of, of planning. And it's not just for if you get sick, but if you have to tend to someone who got sick or you have to do something as a result of this virus, there are so many things that we are doing or not doing that three months ago we never would have conceived of. Um, so, you know, having a, a plan for respite, whether it's having a relative come and help out, having a friend, uh, some uh, extended care facilities offer respite terms of care for a few days or for a few weeks. Um, so we really want to make a respite plan, not because, God forbid, any of you get the, the virus, but it's a good thing to have uh, in any circumstances. Um, Dr. Wynn, what, what concerns you the most about the current situation? I mean, you said Cleveland's not seeing a lot of cases right now, but you're preparing with anticipation there are going to be a lot. So what, what's your biggest concern right now? So I, I should have... So I'm at a Cleveland Clinic location that's in Las Vegas, and right. we have not seen a lot of cases. Uh, Cleveland Clinic in Ohio has seen a substantial number of cases. Um, but part of the reason we haven't seen a lot in Las Vegas, I suspect, is because we didn't get as many testing kits to our state as early as Ohio did. Um, but you know we're we're going to see those numbers increase. I know for sure that Nevada has not reached its peak. Um, Ohio does not seem to have reached its peak either. My biggest worry, I think, is um, that there will be some caregivers who get sick uh, before they're able to tell someone that they're sick and that the one that they care for, the, the individual with dementia, uh, will be stuck without a way to get help. Yeah. So I, I think that's the biggest concern regarding my patients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just the, the potential there could be catastrophic um, yes. it, with a lot of people left without care. Um, mm -hmm. Can't even imagine a worse scenario. Um, Dr. Wynn, thank you so much for your time and for your knowledge. Um, I'm sure it's bringing a lot of people comfort at a very um, high anxiety time. Um, we'll get you the link. We can post the link um, on this chat um, when uh, after this talk um, to see. Uh, you said that Cleveland has some sort of um, is it a, a diagnostic tool or what is it online? It's uh, basically an online screening tool to tell you whether the symptoms that you have are suspicious for the coronavirus. 
Okay, so we'll we'll post that, and all, as always, we um, upload these interviews to beingpatient.com um, in order to um, uh, so that you can uh, share them or um, watch them again if you've missed part of them. Uh, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can do so on our website at beingpatient.com, we, where we will tell you more about these expert interviews. Um, part of our mission is to really bring the experts to you so that you can ask questions and get it straight um, from them. So Dr. Wint, we wish you all the best luck uh, during this very arduous time um, and really appreciate you giving us some time um, to and knowledge. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure and thanks for all you do and thank you to all you caregivers out there who make it possible for us to take care of folks with dementia. Absolutely, thank you.